every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, and you are my portion, and you are my
Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory Is He worthy of this? Yes Does the Father truly love us? He does Does the Spirit move among us? He does and does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal? And open the scroll The Lion of Judah Who conquered the grave He is David's root And the Lamb who died To ransom the slave From every people and tribe Every nation and tongue He has made us a kingdom And priests to God To reign with the Son Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy of this? He Good afternoon or good evening. Whenever and wherever you are, we're glad that you are choosing to meet with us and our God today. I'm Keith Warkentin and this is Carrie. I just wanted to say a big thank you to our church family for supporting our MCC Drive by Pie event. We sold every single pie and every drop of borscht that we made. It was great to work in the kitchen together again and it was so great to see so many faces come by the church parking lot. It was different, but it was still good. We're able to send a check to MCC this week for $6,600 to support the work in Haiti because of your generosity. So thank you very much. Yay. 
If you're looking for a way to connect, there is a congregational meeting coming up at the church. Sign up if you would like to attend in person, or you can attend by Zoom, and then you wouldn't need to sign up. You could just connect with us there. We want to see what's happening at Westwood, so it's a good time for an update, and we would love to connect with you. Our family is in transition this fall. I know a common theme for many of you. We know that uh, many of you may know that we were working overseas this past year in South Sudan with Africa Inland Mission, and now we are readjusting to work and school in a whole new way. God has once again made it possible for me to run a prayer group with students at PGSS this year, which will begin next week. Praise God that my new principal was willing to let us do this. We expect that God will do great things again this year as we pray. Carrie is excited um, to be connecting again with families in our neighborhood through the pack at the school. We are thankful that God gives us opportunities to represent him to the world around us. Would you pray with us as we start? God, we just thank you that we are able to serve you, we're able to be in our spheres of influence, and that we don't have to do it on our own strength, but that we can do it in your strength. And we pray, God, that this morning as we come to worship, that you would be honored. We pray that as we praise you, that your name would be lifted high. And we just want to enjoy your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Please stand, sit, dance, do whatever you feel led to do as we worship our amazing Father this morning.
If you have your Bibles, will you turn to Colossians 1? I just want to read a few verses of scripture with us before we continue on in worship. Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20 says this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. We're going to introduce a new song this morning. Um, And I just want to invite us, if it's a song that's not familiar to you, I would encourage you to open your Bible to Colossians 1, to these verses of scripture, and just sit with them, meditate on them as we sing these words Um, It is a fairly wordy song, and so extra grace as we learn it. Um, Feel free to just sit and sit with the words and meditate and respond in worship in whatever way is comfortable. Let's sing together. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. to the 
And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Good morning, everyone. This morning, we are continuing in our series on Acts called Be the Church. And this morning, we find ourselves in the latter part of Acts chapter 2. And this morning, as we start, I wanted to start by just to get us to think about a certain question. And that question is, what do you want to be known for? And in order to illustrate a little bit about what I'm meaning to say here, I want to tell you a little bit about a story about my grandfather. Uh, his name is Lyle, and he is a grain farmer in southeastern Saskatchewan. And uh, a number of years ago, I would have been about eight, so oh, a few years ago, over 30 years ago, uh, they were doing the grain harvest. Now, the grain harvest is the most important, busiest time of season uh, for a grain farmer. Maybe seeding is close, but you, you just have to get the crop off when there's opportunity to get the crop off. And so during the harvest that year, they were going, they were getting the crop off, and my aunt was following my uncle. My uncle was driving a grain truck, and my aunt was driving a half ton. And um, as they were going, the, the half ton ended up rolling um, with my aunt and my cousins in it, and everyone got rushed to hospital in Regina, some of them with serious injuries, people in comas, uh, neck and back, spinal injuries, lots of crazy stuff like that going on. And my, one, of, one of the things that my grandfather has always said is he's always said that family comes first. And so he felt uh, that uh, as these kids' grandfather, as, as uh, my aunt's, aunt's father-in-law, he needed to be at the hospital, which is a huge sacrifice during uh, the grain harvest for him. He didn't know how they were going to get the grain harvest in, but he just felt like the most important thing in that moment was for him to be at the hospital. So he was at the hospital for, for a few days, just being with his family. And when he returned from the hospital after a few days, he found that many of his fields had been harvested by his neighbors for him. And he was very surprised. And, and my grandfather uh, went to the different people who had helped out, and he just said, like, what do I owe you? What can I pay you for, for taking care of my harvest like this? Like, that's a huge blessing to me. I want to pay you and say thank you. And all the neighbors said to him, you don't owe us anything. You have always been the one that has been there to help us anytime we were in need, and you have done similar things for us, and we know for those of us that you haven't done similar things that you would if ever given the opportunity. You don't owe us anything. See, my grandfather was known in that community for being a generous, servant-hearted man. So much so that in his moment of need, 
people were more than willing to rush to his aid because they knew that he was known for being that exact kind of man. He had set the example that then in that moment when he was in need led to him getting the help he needed. And I, I wanted to, sh- to share this story because that's what my grandfather was known for. And I want to share in Acts chapter 2, it really highlights what the church, the early church in Jerusalem was known for, the characteristics that were true of the church there. But I wanted to highlight, there, there's, two, there's two ends of the spectrum. There's the early church and, and the amazing things that they were known for in Jerusalem. But there's also another spectrum that we can be known for um, as people who, who claim to follow God. And so I wanted to highlight the two kind of opposite uh, realities here. And in order to do that, I wanted to, first of all, read a passage from Isaiah chapter 58 um, with Isaiah, who is a prophet, speaking to the people of Israel about how God sees them, how they are known to God in this moment, and, and then contrast the two. So Isaiah chapter 58, if we go to it, starting in verse 1, and he says, he says this to them. He says, Shout it aloud and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to the people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know me and my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please." You exploit all the workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in the striking of wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fasting I've chosen? Only a day to humble yourself? Is it only for one's head, bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked, to clothe them. And not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer, and you will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the press, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. So I wanted to highlight a, a couple of phrases that especially stood out to me about how they were known and how God was calling them to be. So, first of all, one of the things that really strikes me is this this phrase here. They seem, they seem eager to know me. They seem eager to know me. In other words, they're going through the religious motions. They're doing the things that would make it look like they're eager to know me. You know, they're, they're fasting. They're doing the sackcloth and ash thing, which is a sign of remorse and repentance. They, they, they seem eager to know me. They're doing all the right religious things. They seem eager to know me. But God's obviously pointing out that they're maybe not as eager to know him as they're, as they're making out to be. And then, he, then, he, then he says this, and this one really, really struck me because I think sometimes in, in the North American church we've been guilty of this. He says, only a day only a day to humble themselves? You know, you could, in the North American church context, you might even be able to take it a step further and say, only a Sunday morning to humble ourselves? 
only a day to do the right religious things, only a morning to do the right religious things. And then he says, you just, the rest of the time, you just go about doing life as you please. Only a day to humble ourselves? Is that how we want to be known? People who, who go through the right religious motions for a day, but don't affect it, let it affect the rest of the way that we live our lives? Only a day to humble themselves. Then he begins to call out to the Israelites the way that they should be living their lives. If they're in a relationship with God, if they understand his love for them, then they should be exemplifying that. And so he says, he says, he says is this not the kind of fast that I desire? Is this not the kind of way I want you to show your faithfulness to me? He says, is it not to share? Is it not to share what you have with those in need, the hungry, the, the poor, the naked? Is it not to share? Is it not to spend yourselves in behalf of, insert what you want in the blank, you know, the things it uses in the passage are, 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 are the hungry, and it talks about the naked and the oppressed. Is it not to spend yourself in behalf of, to have this servant posture of giving of yourself to help those who are in need, those who are in poverty. Is it not to spend yourselves in behalf of? He talks about satisfying the needs. How are we to satisfy the needs? How are they to be people who were known for being people that satisfy the needs of those around them? And finally, he, he ends the passage we read, and he talks about them being both repairers and restorers of the city. Repairs and restores of the city. They're part of seeing their city rebuilt and restored and thrive. And, and that's what God's people, he says, are called to do, to be repairers and restorers. See, the problem was, the Israelite people in, the, in that day, they, they, they went through the right religious motions, but in the end, they were really known for being little more than religious pretenders religious pretenders. They, they, they were doing the right things. They made it seem like they were eager to know God, but they weren't actually eager to live out the way that he had called them to live. They weren't, they weren't interested in exemplifying his kingdom values of justice and love and mercy and care for the poor. They weren't interested in living out the kingdom values. They just wanted to go through the religious motions so that God would give them what they want, so God would listen to them, so that they would be blessed. And in the end, God calls them out for being little more than religious pretenders. But that is in stark contrast to what we see in the passage that we have today in Acts. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And I want to read it out and highlight a few phrases from it as well that point out the characteristics that the early church in Jerusalem was known for. Because they were known for something a little bit different. So let's turn to the book of Acts together. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So the this is the first thing that we notice, that they devoted themselves to learning. Now, in, in that time, this didn't exist. There was no Bible. There was no New Testament that they could pick up and be like, hmm, I need to learn how to follow Jesus. Let's go, let's look through the Gospels. Okay, got that. Oh, maybe let's read through some of Paul's uh, epistles to figure it out a little further. Okay, I think I might, might know what it means to follow Jesus. No, the, the New Testament didn't exist at that point. It hadn't hadn't even been written yet. The only way for them to learn in that moment was to devote themselves to listening to the teachers of the apostles, the men and women who had been with Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, the original people, the people who had been witness to his, to his life and to his death and resurrection. The way to learn how to best follow Jesus was to devote themselves to listening to the teachers of these people who had been with Jesus, who knew Jesus the most intimately. And so that's what they did. They devoted themselves to learning from Jesus' closest followers. 
So that's, that's the first thing we notice, that they're devoted to learning. We continue on, and it says, um, and, to the, and they were also devoted to the fellowship and the breaking, to the breaking of bread. So, in other words, fellowship with one another and hospitality. You know, one of the, one of the four things that we've said we want our life groups to be about um, so that they can be full expressions of the church is community. This is what we're talking about. This idea of fellowship and hospitality. And this, this idea of, of breaking bread, it could mean two things. Culturally in that time, in, in the Jewish culture of that day, it was common for a meal to be started, to, the symbol that the meal was beginning would be the breaking of bread. So this could be, specifically speaking, to just sharing an everyday meal. But, but it also, the way that it's worded, could be referring to the Lord's Supper. And what a common practice actually was in that day was to actually share a meal together that included the celebration of the Lord's Supper with one another, communion as we sometimes refer to it. They were devoted to this idea of, of being in each other's homes, having fellowship with one another, and showing hospitality to each other, and to the breaking of bread, to remembering what Jesus had, di- had done for them, and extending that hospitality to others. Continues, it says, everyone was filled with awe. Oh, sorry, I, I missed one. It, it, there's prayer in there. Right, right at the end of the, the, the second verse there, it it's, talks about uh, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And we've said at Westwood, this is one of, our value, one of our core values that we also want to be devoted to prayer. Just to be praying corporately together, to, to be increasing our prayer life as individuals. This is what the early, one of the things the early church was also known for, for being a people of prayer. But then in 43, it says, everyone was filled with awe. They were people who were in awe of God. Now, why? Why specifically in the passage does it talk about them? Um, being in awe of God. Well, it says, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. So they're in awe of God because the church at that time was known for the miraculous. There were healings happening. There were, there were all kinds of different signs and wonders that were being performed by the apostles. It was a church where the Holy Spirit was moving in power, and they were seeing all kinds of miraculous things. And, and so naturally, that just caused them to just be in awe and reverence of God. They saw God in all kinds of different aspects of their life. When we, when we continue on in 44, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as they had need. So we see here, they were generous. They were a generous people. It says they sold possessions when they needed and gave to anybody in need. Anybody in need, it says. In fact, this was so much true of the early church as Christianity began to spread through the Roman Empire that one of the, one of the Roman uh, emperors actually says that these godless Galileans feed not only their own poor, but also ours. Now, he calls them godless because they didn't believe in any of the Roman pantheon of gods. They only believed in, in the one true God. And so he calls them godless Galileans. But he talks about how they, don't eat, they care not only for their own poor, but also others. The, the early church in Jerusalem and the early church uh, that spread from there was known for being generous, for caring for the needs, both within the community of believers and beyond. They were a generous people. And it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They were known for praising God. They worshipped God together. And that's one of the core values we've said we've also want to see lifted up in our life groups in the, as they become, uh, as they exemplify the church and become small expressions of the church is to see the aspect of worship existing, praising God. How do they, that was one of the things they were known for, the joy. And they had such, it talks about them having such great joy in it, in praising God. And finally it ends by saying, and the Lord added to their number daily 
those who were being saved. They were, they were a people who were known for making disciples. And, and the things that they were doing were very attractive. And it talks about the, how they met in the temple courts, and it was likely they met in a place called Solomon's Colonnade uh, so that they could be inclusive of, of women and Gentiles as well. And so it would have been a public a very public place that they were meeting together and, and the things that they were doing and the ways that they were living would have been very attractive and they made disciples and then taught them what it looked like to follow Jesus. Mission was an important part for them. This idea of living out the great commission that Jesus had given them to make disciples. See, the church that is described in Acts chapter 2, they were not known for being religious pretenders. Instead, they were known for being kingdom extenders. They were extending the kingdom of God. They were seeing the kingdom of God break forth all around them by the way that they were living their lives in communion with one another in the Holy Spirit. They were extending the kingdom of God. They were helping the prayer that Jesus had given that, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, they, they were becoming fulfillers of that prayer, being part of seeing God's will lived out here on earth. They were very much what I call kingdom extenders. And so I think for each of us and for us as a church, we have a choice. Do we want to be known as religious pretenders, those who go through all the right religious motions but fail to live out the values of the kingdom of God? Or do we want to be kingdom extenders, joining God in mission, living out the values of his kingdom of love and justice and mercy? Because we get the choice. Jesus consistently called out religious pretenders and called people to instead be kingdom extenders. You look at the Pharisees. He, he, the harshest criticism Jesus had was for the Pharisees because they were doing exactly this. They were being religious pretenders. They, they, they made it look like they were going through all the right motions of being very re devout religious people. But Jesus says, you're whitewashed tombs. You, you look good. It looks good, all that you're doing on the outside, but inside you're dead. You're not really, you don't, you're not really exemplifying my kingdom. And so we get the choice, religious pretenders or kingdom extenders. And, and, and I want to tell you a little bit of, of, of a story of some of the things that I have seen in the global church, because I think, um, for me, the global church has really been an example to me in various places I've been of being kingdom extenders. And I think by their example, there's some things we can learn as we seek to also be kingdom extenders. And so one of the things that, that I noticed, um, especially in Myanmar, is their desire to see the lives of the people that they're interacting with change. And, and so they, they go into communities and, and they seek to, how, how, can we, how can we change the economy here? Seeing people who were, who were extenders Ex internally displaced people basically living in, in, in conditions that no one would want to live in, not having a, a place to call a home, and them taking them in, them, them involving them in, the, in this coffee business and, and giving them meaningful work and, and an income and a home and a community, and, and then seeing many of those people give their lives to Jesus and, and see their spiritual lives revolutionized. And so, so we see economically their lives are changed. The, the building up of schools in those communities so that they can be educated. Their, their lives have been revolutionized. They have gone from being living a life of poor subsistence to actually having community and, and meaningful work and all these things, and, and then also finding Jesus and, and coming alive in the Spirit. See, the Myanmar church showed me in many ways what it looks like to be kingdom extenders as they completely changed 
whole communities. They, they were the rebuilders and restorers of those communities. And I think, I think that we can be rebuilders and restorers and part of and lead the way even in seeing the thriving of our city, of seeing our city come more and more in line with the values of kingdom of God to, to exemplify those things. We can be part of the restoration and the rebuilding of our city in that way as we care for the poor, as we, as we help the needy, as we, as we reach out to those and make disciples. We can become kingdom extenders that become rebuilders and restorers. And so finally, I just want to ask the question of you. As you as an individual, think for yourself. What do you want to be known for? What do I want to be known for? Ask yourself that. What do I want to be known for? Because each of us, as an individual, gets the choice. Do we want to to chase after Jesus, to follow him, to seek to be one of those kingdom extenders? Or are we satisfied with, with just being a religious pretender, going through the motions? Do we want to be a follower of Jesus? Or do we just want to, or are we just okay with being a cultural Christian? We, 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 we associate as being a Christian and we, we've grown up in the church and, and we do all the right Christian things like go to church, but we're not really engaged with Jesus and living out the values he's called us to. What do you want to be known for? Who do you want to be, essentially, is what we're asking. And then I also want to ask, uh, get us to, to think about who do we want to be known for? As Westwood Church, as the Church of Prince George, if he extended even beyond Westwood, what do we want to be known for? Do we want to be known for, oh, I think that that's that building where they go and they, they do some kind of religious services on Sunday. Or maybe not. Now, you, now it's just online. What do we want to be known for? Do we want to be just known for, for that? Or do we want to be known, oh, th- those are those people that care for the poor. Oh, those are those people that have played a role in revitalizing our city. Oh, those are the people who show care and concern for, for, the, for the homeless. That, oh, those are those people who have completely transformed that neighborhood. What do we want to be known for as a church? For me personally, I want to be known as a kingdom extender. And I desperately desire for us as a church to be a church full of kingdom extenders. But it starts with each one of us. Who do we want to be as individuals? And then who do we want to be as a church? Do we want to be religious pretenders or kingdom extenders? Let me pray for us. Jesus, I thank you so much for all that you have done for us for coming, for dying for us, for rising again and defeating death. And thank you for, for involving us in, in seeing your kingdom break forth. Thank you for, for entrusting us with that, Jesus. Help us to follow you closely. Help us to listen to your Spirit's leading. Help us to, in more and more ways, become the kind of people who are kingdom extenders, people who are extending the values of your kingdom and living them out in our everyday lives people who are making disciples, people who are caring for the poor. Jesus, help us to be those kinds of people. I think for many of us, that's our desire, but we admit, God, that we are often weak. <laughs> and, our, that, you know, I, I feel like often our spirits are willing, but our flesh is weak. Uh, we we want to do these kinds of things, but sometimes we fall woefully short. God, strengthen us. Strengthen us by the power of your Spirit to live in this kind of a way that we might be the restorers and rebuilders of this city, that we might see this city revitalized in the name of Jesus. Help us to be obedient to all the things that you are calling us to, all the things that are leading us to. Help us to become people who are secure in your love and therefore can extend that love and that grace to others around us. 
Help us to be conduits of your love, of your grace, of your mercy, of your justice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Christ, who has read. 